Real Time 1960s presents Evening Report, a complete roundup of today's news with Joe Rubenstein. Good evening. In Washington, President Kennedy speaks out on Cuba. In South Vietnam, President Diem shakes up the armed forces. In Stockholm, John Steinbeck gets a Nobel Prize. A newspaper strike hits New York City. California psychiatrists hit LSD. And Cassius Clay hits the airwaves. Those are the headlines. The details after this message. Hi, I'm Donna Reed. I'd like to talk to you about a unique Christmas gift. A gift that will fit any situation, is always in the best of taste, and will never, never go out of style. One guess. You're right, it's money. But not the ordinary kind of money. No, this is growing money. U.S. savings bonds. And savings bonds will keep on growing as long as you keep them. So this Christmas, give growing money. Give United States savings bonds. Thank you. And Merry Christmas. According to Ernesto Che Guevara, a top aide to Fidel Castro, Cuba was ready to launch nuclear attacks in October against multiple U.S. cities, including New York, if the U.S. had launched a new invasion of the island. Guevara, 34 years old, made the statement to a reporter for the communist-affiliated London Daily Worker. Mr. Guevara said, quote, If the Soviet rockets had remained, we would have used them all and directed them against the very heart of the United States, including New York, in our defense against aggression, unquote. The interview took place two weeks after Russians in Cuba had shipped 42 missiles back to the Soviet Union under pressure from the U.S. At his press conference today, President Kennedy was asked if some Soviet offensive missiles may remain in Cuba. It is our best judgment that the missiles have been uh, removed uh, from Cuba and uh, the uh, planes. These things are never uh, 100%, and it is for that reason that we are insisting on uh, verification, or if we can't get the kind of international inspection, we will continue to use our own method of uh, verification, which uh, we believe gives us uh, assurance against a reintroduction of uh, these weapons into uh, Cuba. In New York City Saturday, a newspaper strike hit at the height of the Christmas advertising season. Printers walked out of four papers in a contract dispute, and four other papers shut down voluntarily. A ninth paper published editions only outside of the city. The nine papers have a combined daily circulation of 5.5 million. Since the strike hit, there's been no sign of an early settlement of the dispute, which centers on wages, hours, and vacations. The International Typographical Union struck the New York Times, the Daily News, the Journal American, and the World Telegram and Sun. The papers that shut down voluntarily were the Herald Tribune, the Daily Mirror, the New York Post, the Long Island Star Journal, and the Long Island Press. In South Vietnam Saturday, two troop-carrying U.S. Army helicopters crashed, and five other helicopters plus a single-engine transport plane were damaged during military operations aimed at clearing the Ka Mau province in the communist-infested southern tip of the country called the Mekong Delta. There were no American casualties, but one South Vietnamese soldier lost a leg, and five others were wounded. Last Thursday, a U.S. Army sergeant was killed in a training accident in South Vietnam, and a private was seriously wounded that same day by communist fire. The dead sergeant was identified as Richard Bonzel, 30 years old, of Appleton, Washington. This afternoon, President Kennedy was asked to comment on the progress of the U.S.-backed war in South Vietnam. It was just a year ago that you ordered stepped-up aid to Vietnam. There seems to be a good deal of discouragement about the progress. Can you give us your assessment? No, we are putting in a major effort in Vietnam. As you know, we have, uh, have about 10 or 8, 11 times as many men there as we had a year ago. We've had a number of casualties. we put in an awful lot of equipment. We're going ahead with the strategic Hamlet proposal some phases the military program has been uh, quite successful there is great difficulty however in fighting a guerrilla war you need 10 to 1 or 11 to 1 especially in terrain as difficult as south vietnam so we're not uh, we don't see the end of the tunnel but uh, i must say i don't think it's uh, darker than it was a year ago in some ways lighter Meanwhile, South Vietnam's president, Ngo Dinh Diem, ordered a major reshuffling of the armed forces this week, granting more power to the officers closest to him. President Diem is said to be wary of another attempted coup after the failed attempt in 1960 by a faction of the armed forces. The Southern California Psychiatric Society, or SCPS, expressed alarm today over the increasing unregulated use of lysergic acid diethylamide, commonly known as LSD. 
The SCPS called for the banning of LSD, except under special circumstances. The drug, first synthesized by Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman in 1938, has been used in psychiatric research on test subjects. LSD produces hallucinations and strange illusions, and its advocates claim the drug produces deep aesthetic or so-called religious experiences. Today's report warns of, quote, the abrupt, explosive, depressive states occurring from the use of this drug that may result in suicide. The report goes on to state, quote, the precipitation of schizophrenic reactions, bizarre behavior, and acting out, and the frequent use of this drug by sociopaths for kicks are evidence of its dangers when used under uncontrolled conditions, unquote. At the present time, federal officials do not classify LSD as a narcotic. Last month, however, the FDA announced it was investigating the bootlegging of the drug for recreational use and that a reclassification of LSD is now being considered. I'll have more news for you after this message. She tingles, sparkles, glows. This is her shining hour. It's an enchanted Christmas world. When you give her desert flower. Desert flower by Schulten. Gifts of captivating fragrance that spell excitement this Christmas. Desert flower hand and body lotion. Creamy pink lotion with the heart of lanolin to caress her skin to smoothness. Only $1 and $2. Twice as exciting in a gift set with desert flower dusting powder to puff on like cool air. Only $4. There are so many desert flower gifts from $1 to $10. It's an enchanted Christmas world when you give her desert flowers. Here again, Joe Rubenstein. In Stockholm Monday, John Steinbeck accepted the Nobel Prize for Literature. The Swedish Academy gave him the award for, quote, his realistic and imaginative writings, combining as they do sympathetic humor and keen social perception, unquote. After thanking the Academy, Mr. Steinbeck said that in the modern world, man has, quote, usurped many of the powers we once ascribed to God. Fearful and unprepared, we have assumed leadership over the life or death of the whole world, of all living things. Having taken godlike power, we must seek in ourselves for the responsibility and the wisdom we once prayed some deity might have. Man himself has become our greatest hazard and our only hope. Mr. Steinbeck was the sixth American to be chosen for the award since the first Nobel Prizes were handed out in 1900. The previous American winners were William Faulkner, Sinclair Lewis, Eugene O'Neill, Pearl Buck, and Ernest Hemingway. The producers of Empire, NBC's hour-long Western TV series, have concluded that women and Westerns don't mix. Two female leading roles are set to be cut from the show, and two male roles will be introduced to replace them. The roles to be cut are currently played by Anne Seymour and Terry Moore, who portray mother and daughter respectively. Miss Seymour was cast as head of the family that owns the ranch. The ranch manager is played by Richard Egan. Said one production source, who was involved in cutting the two female roles, quote, Egan is a flunky for a woman, which is bad. He can't conduct himself like a real man because he has to check everything with the woman who owns the ranch. By cutting the female character, he'll be able to boss people around as he ought to, unquote. The daughter, portrayed by Miss Moore, will be married off in February and then leave the ranch. In the following episode, Miss Seymour's character, the boss matriarch, will die. Ryan O'Neill will continue on the show as the matriarch's son. The two actors joining the cast are Charles Bronson and Warren Vanders. Vaughn Meter, a 26-year-old former cocktail lounge pianist, has been earning fame, laughs, and money from impersonating President Kennedy on The First Family, a hit comedy record. New York dealers say the album is flying off the shelves. Uh, sir, would you comment on the African situation, please? Well, no, I, I'm not up to date on that. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> I sent a uh, personal representative to Africa uh, some months ago. So far, she hasn't even dropped me a card. When will we send a man to the moon? Whenever uh, Senator Goldwater wants to go. <laughs> yeah. Now that you're in office, what do you think the chances are for a Jewish president? Well, I think they're uh, pretty good. Now, let me say, I don't see why a person of the uh, Jewish faith can't be president of the United States. I know as a uh, Catholic, I could never vote for him, but other than that... I... 
The recording was made for a small audience on the eventful night of October 22nd. Said Earl Dowd, one of the producers, quote, It was the worst night possible. President Kennedy had just made his speech, saying the Russians had missiles in Cuba. The 150 people we had invited to laugh it up in the studio knew it, too. We went ahead, knowing we'd have to withhold the record if the situation remained tense, unquote. As it turned out, by the time the first family was ready for release, the missiles were on their way back to Moscow. At today's press conference, President Kennedy was asked for his reaction to Mr. Meter's impression of him. It's been a long time since a president and his family have been subjected such to, to such a heavy barrage of teasing and fun poking and satire. I mean, there have been books on backstairs at the White House and cartoon books with clever sayings and, uh, and now a uh, smash hit record. Can you tell us uh, whether you read and listen to these things and whether they produce annoyment or enjoyment? <laughs> <laughs> annoyment. Uh, no, they produce... I, yes, I have read them and listened to them. Actually, I listened to Mr. Meader's record, but I thought it sounded more like Teddy than it did me, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he's annoyed. Teddy, of course, is the president's younger brother, Edward, the newly elected Democratic senator from Massachusetts. Sports, right after this. Faith is for those who look for it, who try each day to know it better. Worship together every week at your church or synagogue. 23-year-old welterweight champion Emil Griffith retained his crown Saturday night with a controversial ninth-round TKO victory over Jorge Fernandez before 5,000 fans at the Las Vegas Convention Hall. In the ninth, Griffith uncorked a hard right that landed squarely on his opponent's protective cup. The sound could be heard throughout the arena. Don Dunphy was the man at the microphone. Fernandez is still down, and he is in severe pain. There isn't any question about that. This is going to be real controversial. We've learned from Dick Porter, the ring announcer, that referee Harry Krause has considered it a low blow. Because these fighters were, uh, they are supposed to uh, equip themselves with a protector that is good enough to withstand any punch. However, apparently that did not happen here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dick Porter. It is a technical knockout. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, because... Dick Porter is, is trying to finish his announcement. Because Emil Griffith was ahead and score. He is the Following the verdict, there was concern in the hall that perhaps a major riot was in the offing. However, when heavyweight champion Sonny Liston climbed into the ring to referee the next fight, the crowd quickly quieted. The Nevada Athletic Commission held a special meeting on Monday to review Saturday's incident. While the commissioners and referee Harry Krause did not deny it had been a foul punch from Griffith that ended the fight, that fact could not change the verdict because under present Las Vegas regulations, a fight cannot be lost on a low blow. Said Commission Chairman Jim Deskin, quote, It was an unfortunate ending, but the rule is clear and it's in writing, unquote. In the heavyweight ranks, the next fight on undefeated Cassius Clay's schedule will be a 10-rounder versus Charlie Powell in Pittsburgh on January 24th. Powell, a former football player with the NFL's San Francisco 49ers and the AFL's Oakland Raiders, won two bouts by knockout earlier this year. Late last month, Clay faced a two-hour barrage of questions as fans, detractors, and neutralists called in to radio station WHAS in the fighter's hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. The program, hosted by Milton Metz, began with a query about Clay's temper or lack thereof. Do you ever lose your temper in the ring? Well, I never lose my temper because when you lose your temper, you, you get wild. You have the tendency to get wild, and uh, when you get wild, you don't know what you're doing half time. But great fighters don't lose the temper. Fighters such as uh, Jack Dempsey, Gene Tooney, Joe Lewis, Sugar Ray, uh, they do not lose the temper. When a fella have the right amount of speed and natural ability and class and science, well, uh, you never can tell when he's hot. Precious, do you ever lose your temper uh, in uh, life outside of the ring yourself? No, I don't. I have no police records whatsoever. No, no kind of record. Well, I don't mean that. I mean, you know, like in a family squabble or a, a mm -hmm. friend. Uh, well, yes, I may lose my temper with my brother over the food table. He may won't take all ice cream sometime, and we might have to uh, go to war over that sometimes. That's about the only time I lose my temper when you mess with my money and my food. 
Next up was a young lady interested in Clay's romantic pursuits. Well, when you add on training or sighting and so forth, do you date very much? Oh, it's a strange thing. I do not. I do not have any girlfriends. The closer I get to the championship, the less uh, interest I have in girls. But uh, that would happen uh, when the time comes. But uh, my girlfriend right now is boxing. And my dates are coming to these radio interviews, TV interviews, and going to fights. Those are my biggest dates. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Toward the end of the program, an older fan expressed fatherly concern at the prospect of Clay facing Sonny Liston. Cassius? Yes. I'm awful glad to talk to you. I, I heard the other day they, they've raised you up to number four now, haven't they? Well, yes, I should have been number four a year ago. I think so, too. Right. And uh, you want to look out for that list, Liston boy now, Cassius, because he, he, he's bad news, but then I, I believe you can do it. Well, they say Liston is great, but he must fall in eight. Yeah, he, he hits hard, doesn't he? You just be at ringside. Don't worry about Mr. Liston. I'll take care of him. Take care of him. Huh? Right. All right, Cassius. I'm glad to talk to you. You're welcome. Good night, Mr. Lomar. Good night. Good night. That's a real nice man. Yes, he is. Liston, when informed recently that Clay had threatened to knock him out in eight rounds, expressed no concern whatsoever, stating, quote, I'm not going to promise him he'll last eight seconds, unquote. And that, for this evening, completes our look at the latest news on this Wednesday, December 12th, 1962. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day tomorrow. This has been your Evening Report, a roundup of the latest news with Joe Rubenstein.